What's good, Meaningful Movers? Welcome back to Moving with Meaning, the podcast where actions have meaning, words have meaning, and we open up the conversations to discover what's your next move. I'm your host, Crystal. In today's episode, we are going beyond the finish line. Not just beyond, but explore what's behind it all, the brain. But you know how we do it here. We need to set that theme. So let's go ahead and do that. The word of the day is innovation. What a theme. Aren't we all looking for new ways of improving? Not just looking, but implementing. Not just new, but valuable. Because let's face it, without value, there really isn't any innovation, is it? That's enough of me talking. How about we introduce our guest, and there's no one better to do that than himself, Liam. Why don't you give the people a bit of background about yourself and what you're going to share with us today? Sure. Hello, Crystal. Thank you very much for uh, having me on your show and giving me the opportunity to share my ideas. Yes, so my name's Liam Naden. I'm a, a researcher and a teacher really consumed with answering one question, which is, how do we really get the results we do in our life? In other words, why is our life the way it is? And not only why do we get the results that we want, but why do we get the results we don't want? You know, something that many people are very interested in is, you know, there are things about my life that I don't want. Why are they showing up in my life? So anyway, this is something that I've studied over many decades. It took a major event in my life, which was going from being very successful and a multimillionaire to becoming homeless, that really got me set on a different track and understanding this whole thing about how we get what we want in a completely different way. And that's what I teach and share now. Well, that's interesting. Why don't you, maybe not, you don't have to go into too much detail about how you went from high success to homelessness, but perhaps just how you felt when you lost everything and then what epiphany came sure. about that made you kind of yeah. rethink things. Well, the thing was, I was one of these people, maybe like many of your listeners, who has always been consumed with this idea of how can I be the best that I can be? How can I achieve more? How can I have a great life, not just a mediocre life? In other words, how can I be successful? And I went in all sorts of different directions to try and find the answer. And I started off in a religious family and I thought I found the answer there as a child. And the answer which was given to me was, well, if you want to be happy, if you want to be successful, if you want anything, you just pray. You ask God for what you want, ask and you will receive and God will give it to you. Well, that didn't quite work out for me. And I noticed it wasn't really working for the people who were telling me that that's the way to go either. That was the first of many things. And I went down the whole area of personal development, motivation, peak performance, spirituality, looking at all sorts of different methods and techniques, going to seminars everywhere, reading lots of books, doing courses listening to recordings of things that helped you reprogram your subconscious mind and change your beliefs and all of those things. You know, goal setting, the whole area of writing down what you want and being really clear about it and having pictures about what your goals were and lists of actions that you were going to take and all of the things that you were saying to yourself about positive thinking and the right words and thoughts. I did all of this sort of stuff and I also did, as I said, spiritual things like meditation and other things to work on my spiritual side the law of attraction all of those sorts of things yeah just i want to just make a really good point about the faith piece every time that we're struggling with something go to faith ask and you shall receive you will receive you're going to receive tools motivation you're not going to actually receive what you're asking for but you're going to be receiving the methods and the thought process and particular events in life that get you to where you're getting ready to go to now, I believe. So I think it's just about reshaping the faith and the expectation of what we do when we're talking about asking for certain things, because we have to do the work kind of the way you're, you just des described it. You had to do a ton of just inner work, a ton of outer work to get to where you are. So I think it, it was answered in, in, in and in just differently just in a way that we just didn't expect it to be. I just wanted to make that little piece there. Well, we can talk a little bit about the, the role of religion because actually the Bible is probably the best 
manual, instruction manual on how to live your life that we've been given from a biological perspective, not a faith perspective, but from a mechanical perspective as how you actually operate as a human being and how you're designed to get everything that you want. But most people have completely misinterpreted it. So we can talk about that as well, because it's not actually about asking, because here's the thing, just as an aside to this, if somebody knew you really well and loved you far more than you knew, like if you're a parent, you know this, you love your children more than they can ever know and more than you can ever express. And you want the best for them. You want them to have the most magnificent life possible. But here's the thing. You know, when they're a little child, you know far more about what's good for them than they do. So if they came to you and said, please, can I have an ice cream? Oh, please, I, it would be, make me so happy. And I'm asking and I know I will, re will receive. Please, can I have it? Now, you as a parent, if it's quarter to six in the evening and you're about to have dinner, or for whatever reason, you know it's not the best thing for them, you're not going to give them what they're asking for. Mm, true. Not because, not because you're a horrible parent, but because you are a loving parent. So that's exactly the way we're designed to live. We're not designed to get what we want, Yes. What we think we want, we're designed to get what is going to make us the happiest, most successful, best person that we can be. That's what we're designed to get in our life. And if we're not getting it, the reason is we're not using the mechanics of how we do actually get that in the right way. If you're on a on the the telephone and you're dialing the wrong number, it doesn't matter who you're talking to, you're talking to the wrong person. It doesn't matter what you say. You're talking to the wrong person and the right person is trying to say to you look i've got some information that you need but you've dialed the wrong number you're not using the telephone in the right way and it's the same with the machinery and what we what specifically i discovered the main machine for your success is your brain it is a machine that you've been given biologically for one purpose and that is to make you biologically successful which means to be the best that you can be because all of nature Every living thing is designed for one purpose overall, and that is to survive. And to survive the longest, you need to be the best that you can be, and you've been given the machine to ensure that happens, which is your brain. So God has given you this machine to say, I've created you with the purpose of you having the best life possible. I couldn't do anything else because I am pure love. I love you. How could, you, you know, you're my creation. How could I not want the best for you? And I've given you a machine to ensure that if you use it the right way, you will get all of the best. You will get it. But I can't help you to get what you really need and want to be your best if you're not using it the right way. If you've dialed the wrong number, if you haven't even picked up the phone at all, <laughs> I, can't, I can't help you. So our role in life is to learn how to use what we've been given the right way so we get all the good things happen to us. We've misinterpreted it and we're not doing it the right way, which is why... We've all got problems, why most people have problems. If you think about life, if the purpose of life is to survive, and the best chance you have of survival is when you are your best, how do problems fit in? Problems don't help you last longer. They don't make you stronger. They do the opposite. You know, science is more and more realizing that stress causes health problems. It's the major cause of health problems. But they're not good for you, in other words, so they they can't be, you're not designed to have problems is essentially what I'm saying. And that's true on a biological level. It's not just an idea. And the fact that most people have problems is not because they're natural, but it's because they're not using this machine, which is designed all of the time to try and bring you everything that you need to make you your best and happiest, simply not using it the right way. Interesting. Interesting. I have, a, I have a few guests that are have a different perspective on stress. It's from, it, from a perspective that it, it's natural, it's symptomatic, and it's something that should be managed because that is natural. But we're going to keep on this train. So tell me about how we use the brain first in the wrong way, and then you can enlighten us on the right way. Well, I've created a four-part brain model, which is based on science you can use all sorts of technical words to describe these four parts of the brain, which each have a different function. And it's the way those four parts are used that is the way either determines if you use them the right way, you lock into this being the best that you can be, living 
your natural purpose. And if you use the, these four parts the wrong way, problems show up in your life. So maybe I can explain the four parts and in, in a simple way, because my four-part brain model is not a technical, scientific, full of jargony thing. It's a very simple explanation as, as to how your brain works. And then I think once I explain it, most people go, I can see where you're going with this. I can see now what I'm doing wrong, why I'm using it the wrong way. And funnily enough, if all the science is also exactly what it says in the Bible as well. So anyway, there are four parts to your brain, as I, as I said. The first part is what I call your rational thinking brain. Now your rational thinking brain, which is located in your neocortex, which is the top part of your head, what this is, this is a, a library or a database that collects, gathers and stores all of the information that you gather in every moment of your life. So it's like everything that you experience through your senses, everything you smell, taste, touch, hear or see, and all of your thoughts, all of the ideas, they all get taken into this rational thinking brain and stored there so that you can retrieve this information at a later time and use it to make sense of things. You can label things. You can, you can talk to other people and communicate and have a common idea, a common language. That's the rational thinking brain. The second part, which is located just below your rational thinking brain inside your skull, because remember, these are physical places and physical functions. This is not talking about the subconscious mind and all that sort of stuff. This is physical, this is biological. So the, the second part of your brain is the emotional feeling brain. And this part is responsible for, as the name suggests pretty simply, how you feel. It creates chemicals which determine how you feel. Everything from really happy, grateful, loving, excited, passionate, all those things, to the other end of the scale, fearful, worried, stressed and anxious. So that's the emotional feeling brain. Now the third part of your brain which is at the back of your head and at the base of your skull. That's what I call your survival brain. And your survival brain, again, it's pretty self-explanatory, but it manages everything to do with keeping you alive on a moment-by-moment -moment basis without you having to think about it. Okay, so in your physical body, obviously all of the processes, your organs, you know, your breathing, heart rate, everything else, this is all managed without your awareness by your survival brain. And there's another really important function that your survival brain has to keep you alive on a moment-by-moment -moment basis without you having to think about it, and that is in the very rare situation where you might be faced with a threat to your survival or a danger. And what happens then in the survival brain is it has this weapon or a mechanism called the fight-or-flight mechanism. I'm sure we've heard about that. Mm -hmm. This part of your survival brain, this tool, this weapon that the survival brain has, is designed to kick in and react to any threat or danger and eliminate it. So if someone comes running at you and is about to hit you, you know, you're going to automatically put your hand up to protect yourself or shout for help or prepare to fight or run away. You know, in the, when the brain was four millions of years ago, there were lots of lions roaming about the jungle, weren't there? <laughs> so, you know... When the lion roared and jumped out from behind the rock, your survival brain fight or flight mechanism kicked in and you just reacted. And that's what we do now when we face with a threat like someone wanting to attack us. So we react. And remember, this is without thinking. This is not coming from your thinking brain. This is an automatic response. The it's involuntary. Really, okay, right. It's really right. important to understand that because that's the part that gets misused. And this is why, because the fourth part of your brain is the most important part, really. It's the part that's designed to run your life and to make sure that you're the best that you can be. And it's what I call your creative brain. And your creative brain is centered right in the very center of your head. Well, what the creative brain is responsible for is your creativity, your imagination, your motivation, your resourcefulness, your awareness of something bigger than you, than your physical world. This is where you get those aha moments. It's where, you, where all of your problem-solving ability lies. You know, often we're struggling with a problem and we can't figure out, oh, I, I don't know the answer to that. And suddenly the solution comes out of the blue from, from nowhere. We don't know where it comes from. It hasn't come from sitting down, trying to figure it all out, using our rational thinking brain, doing the pros and cons and everything else. We suddenly come up with an inspiration, a new idea, innovation.
that wonderful word you started at the beginning. Where does innovation come from? It doesn't come from struggling and trying to figure stuff out. It comes from suddenly someone gets a new idea about something. Where does that come from? This is the creative brain. You know, composers, musicians, people have described this part of the brain throughout history. Composers and musicians say things like, I just heard the music and I wrote it down. I, I don't know where it came from. It just came from somewhere. This is the creative brain. So the whole purpose of the creative brain is when you are being the best that you can be, when you are living your biological purpose, doing the right things, not doing the wrong things. You know how often we get that gut feeling, oops, I shouldn't be doing yeah. this. That little voice, you know, it says you're making the wrong decision or it says you're making the right decision. We, have, we sometimes have that, I know this is going to work. I don't know why, I don't know how. Like I see that person over there. I'm going to marry that person. I don't know how or why, but I just feel it's going to happen. All of this stuff is happening in the creative brain. It's when your creative brain is driving your life. And we've all had these moments where things seem to just go well. You know, we meet the right people or somebody shows up. We're making good decisions. Things are happening easily. We're working hard, but things are all clicking into place. We call it being in the flow, being in the mm -hmm. zone. You know, this is how we're naturally designed to live. And in fact, science has a word for this state where everything is flowing perfectly. And it's called homeostasis. And yeah. all nature lives and strives to live in the state called homeostasis, which means the perfect functioning of the organism. Because when you think about it, when an organism is functioning perfectly, that's when it has the greatest chance for survival. That's when it's wiring to survive is best expressed, that it's doing the right things. Let me respond to this one. So now that you've explained it, it makes sense. I'm finding myself very much irrational and creative, but exactly what you, you mentioned before, how we're trained, our brain is how we bring our, ourselves back to equilibrium, homostasis, what have you. Of course, it's not natural, but I think problems do come up and that's why the creative brain is there to support these changes in our biological states to support that. But I think this is also influenced by our environment, right? So some people are incredibly imaginative, incredibly creative, and some aren't. And some of the folks who aren't, they have been in positions that, or environments, careers that haven't allowed them that kind of have stifled their voice. So that ended up bringing down the creative brain piece of that, which has impacted that. And so they kind of have to relearn because it, it was conditioned to them. So I just wanted to throw that into that as well before we move on, just to take that into consideration. Can I ask you a question though, Crystal? If I came along to you and said, Crystal, I have a computer here it has the computing power of 500 trillion computer microprocessors. It's vastly more powerful than all of the computers that exist on the planet. And I can get that computer to do one thing, and that is make your life amazing. Make you the best that you can be. Make you really happy. Make you doing all of the things that are going to make you in every moment go, wow, this is amazing. I absolutely love my life. And solve any problem and make sure that problems don't show up in your life, that actually literally is, will work to block problems, to bring the right people into your life at the right time, to get you doing the right things at the right times, it will create the right environment. Now, would you be interested in a computer like that? I would be interested, but I think because of my rational brain, right, I would question it. I would be cautious, oh, sure. right? Yes. So it, it's not so much that it's, the machine that is there, it's the fact that there are too many variables to guarantee that piece of what you, you were promising in that particular machine. It's kind of like AI. AI isn't just, you just implement it and it's there. AI is a learning mechanism. So it learns by ingesting data and the reactions and our reactions, as well as the outcomes. And so as we grow and learn, it becomes better. So okay. I could never say, if you had brought that to me, I would be immediately skeptical because I know you cannot get it at the point of the beginning. 
it's something that grows over time and becomes better over time, right? Because it's innovative. It's improving, continuous improvement. So I would look at it that way. That's the way I would answer that. Okay, but putting your skepticism aside, if you firmly believed and understood, you know, your first question might be, could such a computer exist? So then you would do some more research. And if you came to the conclusion that not only could a computer like that exist, but it actually did exist, it's a bit like any machine. You know, if I came along and said, would you be interested in this coffee maker that makes really good coffee um, and it does it in half the time, you'd go, yeah, you know, and, and, if, and particularly if it had lots of reviews or was reputable and other people had, had confirmed and clarified that this exactly was the best coffee machine you could get, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be a skeptic there. You'd go, oh, well, it obviously is the best coffee machine. So if, if instead of you being a skeptic about this computer, if I could show you all sorts of not only proof, but verification from other people explaining that this, that this computer does exist and it is indeed what it's designed to do and it will and can do it. And not only that, but the people who, who said that you totally respected. In other words, Jesus, for instance, if Jesus came along and said, I don't know about your religious feeling. Yes, but I am. I am very. <laughs> Jesus said, yes, there is a computer that exists and it does that and it will do that if you use it the right way then your skepticism, I would suggest, is probably going to go away and you go, okay, well, I'm going to look into this and I'm certainly going to try it out. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Like, that's what I was saying before. I wouldn't just take the word immediately. It would be something right. of interest and it would be something supported by others. So the apostles, okay, I'm now I'm, I'm starting to believe this. The miracles, okay, yeah, starting to come about. It's not something that is easily accepted because it's different. It's not something that's easily acceptable because it's something new. We've never heard of it. We've never done it before, but it, it doesn't mean it's any less true. It's just that the consumption of that information and the acceptance of it is something that you obviously go in and put in work and, and research into. That's all I was saying. Yeah. I mean, if you look at all of history, you know, again, this word innovation, the, the, the history of mankind is someone coming up with a new idea and it turning out to be the truth. And most people discount it straight away mm -hmm. because it doesn't fit in with, with the current narrative. I mean, how long did we were people told the earth was flat or we were told that you know, the sun and the stars revolved around the earth and the earth didn't move because otherwise we wouldn't be able to stand up. Everybody mm -hmm. knew that was logical. But new information came along which showed that that was, that was actually true. But the person who said it at the time was, I don't have enough proof. People were saying, we don't have enough proof. or un What we don't have is understanding to know that that's true. So right. what I'm saying is that the brain, and there are many, many books that have been written about the brain, and they all say this about the brain, that it is indeed of this enormous power, and it has one purpose, which is to ensure that the organism achieves the state of homeostasis, which is being the best that it can be, so that it has the greatest chance for survival. That's its biological function, nothing more, nothing less. So knowing all of that, then you would say, I want to know how to use this machine the right way, so that I achieve homeostasis. And if I'm not achieving homeostasis, in other words, if I'm not being the best that I can be, if I'm stressed with problems and everything else, you know, obviously something is going wrong. I'm not using the machine the right way. When you have a machine, problems only show up when you're not using it the right way. So coming back then to this, this creative brain, if we can accept that the state of homeostasis, being the best that we can be, is the state we're designed to live in naturally. Because if you look at the rest of nature, it exists mostly in a successful state. Every animal, creature, living thing is in a state of homeostasis. They're just being what they are. You know, there have been estimates to say that in nature, the success rate is 98%. Nearly every living thing is doing what it's supposed to be doing and being the best that it can be. It's not getting all stressed and, and, and dealing with problems all the time. But of course, we're the other way around. You know, the same research that I was reading was saying that, you know, humans are the opposite. We're 98% unsuccessful. But here's the thing, and I think this will explain a bit about how the brain works and why problems show up in people's lives and why we're not living in this great state of inspiration. We all have inspiration. We all have imagination. Now, we're not necessarily talking about, you know, you, you write a concerto before breakfast or something or come up with these amazing new ideas. But we all have these faculties within us which are designed to be used as tools for us to make us the best version of ourselves. Doing what we're supposed to be doing, 
that's going to make us successful for us. And this is why comparing yourself doesn't work either, because we're all individuals. Let's look at what goes wrong. We've got these four parts, rational thinking brain, emotional feeling brain, survival brain, including your fight or flight mechanism, and your creative brain, the master, the controller that's designed to make your life flow. But what happens is, if your creative brain is supposed to manage your life, we are supposed to live in this natural creative state, this state of homeostasis, except for one instance in our life. And that is when we're faced with an unexpected threat or danger. So here we are living our life, being happy, being excited, things are going well, and all of a sudden a lion runs out from behind the rock. Now what happens then is what your brain actually does, because co constantly what it's doing, and it's actually doing it through your emotional brain, but it's a little bit complicated to explain, but your emotional brain is like a sentry. It's always constantly on the lookout for danger. The message it's sending all the time is everything's safe, everything's good, and that activates the creative brain to say, carry on being the best that you can be, doing the right things, don't worry, everything's going well. However, if it sees a threat, what it does is it changes the chemicals because the emotional brain, the signal is chemicals. In other words, your feelings, how you feel. So it sends a different set of chemicals. And what that actually does is it shuts down your creative brain temporarily and it takes all of the energy that would otherwise be used for that and it activates your survival fight or flight brain. And in that state, the fight or flight mechanism fights off the danger. So it uses all of the energy that you have to run away or fight or shout for help or whatever it is. And as soon as that danger has gone, then the emotional brain recognizes, well, everything's safe now. The danger has gone. And it changes the chemicals. It changes the, your nervous system and it reactivates your creative brain and it shuts down your survival brain. But here's the thing. Those two things don't operate together because it's like a switch. The term for this is you activate something called your sympathetic nervous system when you activate your survival, fight or flight, or you activate your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your creative brain. But what activates it, what determines which part of your brain you activate and use is your emotions. So here's the thing. When your brain says everything's good, it sends happy chemicals, neurotransmitters or hormones to make you feel good. That activates the creative brain. When it sees danger, it sends other chemicals that create fear and the underlying parts like stress, worry and anxiety. So what's actually happening on a biological level, when you feel fear, stress, worry, anxiety, your brain is saying to you there is a threat to your survival and it's activating your survival, fight or flight. You might not be in a panic, but it's still activating that part and it's shutting down your creative brain. So can you see what the problem is here? People are trying to solve their problems, work out what their goals should be, work out what they should be doing, trying to be imaginative, trying to cr be creative, trying to figure out their life using a part of their brain that's not designed to do that, that doesn't have a clue about any of those things. It's only there to react and fight off danger. All of those resources are blocked off. They're in this creative brain. And people are going, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm so confused. I can't think straight. What should my goals be? I'll try and figure it all out. And they're trying to use their rational thinking brain. But remember, the rational thinking brain doesn't know very much. It only knows what you've experienced in your life. It doesn't have access to infinite knowledge. And people are wondering why they're struggling and stuck because they've activated the wrong part of their brain. Now, this is interesting when I started to really research this and put all of the dots together. I've heard something like this before. When you're afraid, you're going to limit yourself and you can't activate your creative brain. You can't live your life properly. I thought, that's interesting. The Bible says 365 times, be not afraid. Now, it's not saying, try not to be afraid, don't worry. Be not, it's an instruction. Because what it's saying to you is, don't be afraid. Because when you are afraid, you're activating your survival, fight or flight, sympathetic nervous system. And you're shutting down the part that I, God, have given you to manage your life and make it the best that you can be. So that you get all the right stuff in your life. You're acting like there's a threat or a danger there. It says, do not worry about what you shall eat, drink or wear. It will all be provided for you. And it's provided for you with through your creative brain. But only when you use that part of your brain. If you're in a state of fear, stress, worry, anxiety, you're never going to figure it out. Your brain can't see. It can't do this stuff. It can't bring you the right ideas, solutions to anything. Because all of that part of your brain is literally shut down. Yeah, I think that was 
the part of what I was expressing earlier with the skepticism. I'm glad you answered it. Let me just say it that way. (laughs) So I think it was a good exchange to bring that part up and then to hear the parts of the brain that are supposed to work in a certain way. And when certain pieces are triggered, it shuts down uh, the other part of the brain that should be handling that particular task. It's, It's not something that's easily done to not be afraid, but it is informative to bring this piece to light to know that, okay, when I am feeling this way, I know that I'm thinking emotionally or I'm in a survival state and I need to change either my way of thinking, meditate or what have you to bring me back to homeostasis to activate the creative brain to get me to where I need to be. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Here's the really interesting thing. Our whole life, we have been trained in a completely different way to use our brain the wrong way. So you realize you've got to practice. There isn't one thing that you're going to get straight away that's going to get the result. You need to learn and you need to practice and that's going to take time. And the longer you've spent in your life doing it the wrong way, the more you're going to have to relearn and the more you're going to have to practice. Now, the good thing is it doesn't need to take the rest of your life. And what I find what with my coaching, I've created this model, the four-part brain model, and I've also created a process called brain rebalancing, which shows you how to rebalance these four parts of your brain in a much easier way than the way I had to do it, which was through catastrophes that happened in my life from doing it the wrong way, going from wealthy to homeless. That's how I learned how to do all this, but you don't have to do it that way. It doesn't need to take your lifetime to understand and practice it, but it does take a little bit of rethinking and unlearning all of these things. And that really formed the basis for my new work that I do and and now what I share with other people to help them get the same results. Thank you. I think we had a really good exchange here. So I definitely appreciate the analogies that you drew. Those were great. And I also appreciate you entertaining my skepticism. And it was definitely to add value. It's great, isn't it? It's a great conversation. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, Liam, are you ready to give us your golden nuggets and add that ketchup just to recap? Well, I think the bottom line is to what I like to say, you have to let yourself off the hook. You have to realize that trying to reach goals and solve your problems through force and struggle, all that does is keep you stuck. And instead, you need to allow this creative energy to flow through you, because when you do that, you actually activate a different part of your brain. And it's that part of your brain which is going to lead you on a far easier and far more enjoyable path to you being what you're supposed to be, which is the best you can be. That's all we can be. I think that's the only path there is. That's the episode today. I'm all about activating all parts of my brain. I should be. That's part of the premise of my new fantasy book series. For most of us, we don't give ourselves enough credit. We are so hard on ourselves that we actually anticipate others to give us the break, whether we are aware of it or not. And why should they? If we are setting the expectations so high, they do say lead by example. That's why I appreciate Liam sharing his personal story and the comeback with a reset. What part of the four-part brain model do you feel needs nurturing? Even if you have imparted some of the biological mechanisms to increasing your chances of survival, I want to hear how you were able to let yourself off the hook. I love it all and so will someone else. Before I let you go, Liam, why don't you go ahead and remind the people who you are? where they can find your resources or reach out to you. Thank you. Well, my name is Liam Naden, N-A-D-E-N, and my website is just my name, liamnaden.com. And if they go there, I've got a ton of stuff, my own podcast, which explains a lot of this. I've got free courses and a free webinar, and really to try and help people understand who you are, how you're designed to live, and all of the resources you actually have right at your fingertips. Thank you so much. I'll make sure to include all of Liam's resources and connections in the episode description, as well as on my website's resources page, movingwithmeaning.com. Make sure you guys subscribe to the show, Moving With Meaning, the podcast, and tap that alert bell so you know when these episodes drop. I am on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and YouTube Music. Please share, like, repost, and follow. Tag someone. We are creating a community here. Quick housekeeping before you go, follow me on Instagram at movingwithmeaning82. Also connect with me on LinkedIn. I do dabble in TikTok at Crystal B. Clark. My YouTube channel is up. Kindly run over there and have a look or two. Links are in the episode. Alrighty, I'm Crystal. 
on Moving With Me in the podcast, reminding you to take it one step at a time. All moves have meaning. Check y'all later.